all right, so today what we talk about uh, is two random variables, okay? So we've kind of gone about as far as we can go with a single random variable, okay? So uh, kind of what we talked about last time was functions of a random variable, right? So last time um, we were talking about if I gave you some function of x, how would I know what would be the PDF and CDF of this new random variable and how could I reason about it, right? Um, but this is a case where y is entirely predicted from x. If I, if I tell you x, you know y with 100% certainty, right? But there are lots of cases where we want to study two random variables, say x and y, that uh, may or may not be related to each other. So for example, your height and your weight, right, are both random variables. They have their own distributions, which you could look at and model, okay, it looks like a Gaussian in height and a Gaussian in weight, but there are also potentially correlations between the random variables, right? And that's what makes things more interesting is that these random variables aren't always necessarily independent, but that can vary against each other, right? So the premise basically is, um, you know, let's say what I, what I said last time was this, you know, y is entirely predictable from x, but today we want to talk about kind of like x and y as a pair of joint random variables. And we're interested in kind of understanding how these random variables are related to each other and so on, right? So what may happen is you know, same kind of setup as before if we go all the way back to what random variables were, right? So in this case, we could imagine that I take, you know, some sort of an experiment with a, some sort of a sp sample space, and I do an experiment, and what comes out is instead of one real number, what comes out are, you know, two real numbers, say, x and y, right? And sometimes it's more, so there's, I guess I should probably draw this a little bit more, a little bit more better. So really, you know, x comes out of one arrow and y comes out of the other arrow, right? Forget this middle arrow. So um, in fact, a lot of times it's useful to think about, um, you know, this as a two-dimensional geometry problem, right? So for example, uh, you could also imagine this as saying, I have my sample space, I do my experiment, I get an outcome, and then I can plot where the outcome is as a point in the xy plane, right? That also kind of makes a little bit more sense. So for example, I pick a random point in time during my car trip, I look at the GPS coordinates, that is a random variable x comma y, right? Or I throw a dart at the dartboard and I get a xy location, or maybe I can represent that like polar coordinates, I could imagine getting like an r theta combination. Um, or you could, you know, and take something like, you know, I look at the high temperature for the day and the low temperature for the day, and I model that as a two-dimensional random variable, like a random vector, okay? And so, in general, you could certainly have, like, you know, a three-dimensional random variable, a four-dimensional random variable. Today, we're gonna just talk about two dimensions, but if you took a course um, like communication theory, or if you took a graduate level course like stochastic signals and systems, you would be dealing with kind of random vectors where every element was actually its own random variable, okay? Um, so let me make this a little bit more concrete. Um, so for example, let's suppose that I flip a coin n times, going back to coin flipping, and let's let x equal the number of heads and y equal the position of the first head, which, if there are no heads at all, I'm going to say is zero. So kind of from what we know before, clearly x is binomial, we already know that, and y is kind of geometric, right? We're flipping the coin until we get our first success. And it's not entirely geometric because we're cutting things off at n, right? So I could have up to n heads, and if I haven't gotten a head so far, I just call the random variable zero, right? So it's kind of geometric. So um, x we know is gonna be binomial, 
and y we know is going to be kind of geometric. But clearly there's a relationship between these random variables, right? So for example, I know that if I got three heads, my y has to be uh, one, two, or three, right? Can't be zero, can't be four, five, or six. And, you know, so knowing x tells me something about y and vice versa, right? So that means that these two random variables are related, and we're going to be able to explore things like whether they're independent, whether they're correlated, and stuff like that. We're going to talk about that mostly next week, but this is just kind of the setup for just the terminology we need to even talk about joint random variables, okay? So, um, or I could say, uh, you know, I go to a bank, and X is the time in line, and Y is the time that it takes me to get my transaction completed, right? Now, there's, there's a situation, oh, oh I'm, I'm, uh, have a bad view, okay. So, here's a situation where, you know, depending on how I model things, maybe there's no reason to think that X and Y are related to each other at all, right? That, the time I'm waiting in line maybe doesn't have a real impact on how long I'm waiting for service. Or I could say something like, you know, X is, all right, sorry about this, there we go. Or I could say something like, you know, X is the, uh, you know, a person's height, and Y is a person's weight, okay? And here again, there's bound to be some sort of general relationship between these two things. You know, the taller you are, the heavier you are, probably, in a general sense, right? Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about is, is how do you model those things, right? So all of the terminology that we've learned about so far for single random variables carries over to the world of multiple random variables, right? So you could have a two-dimensional event. You could have uh, a two-dimensional PDF, a two-dimensional CDF, right? So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today is kind of like taking all the stuff that we talked about for single random variables and moving them into this two-dimensional world with the understanding that, you know, really I could talk about this in any number of dimensions that I wanted to, but two will be good enough for us today, okay? Um, okay, so let's start with events, right? What would an event look like? So if I kind of stick with this kind of notion that my random variable is a point somewhere in this two-dimensional space, then an event is basically like a region of the 2D plane that I can color in and say, what's the probability that I landed in this place, right? So um, we can say a joint event, bless you, and actually, I think my pen is dying, so I'm gonna to switch to red for today. Don't get too excited. Um, so for example, in the um, GPS case, um, I could ask something like, you know, what is the event corresponding to uh, I'm five kilometers away from home? Right, so I could say, okay, here's a pin where my home is, and I could draw a circle, and this would be the event corresponding to being five kilometers away from home, right? And if I wanted to, I could be really precise. I could say this is the set of points x, y, such that, you know, x minus my home coordinate squared and y minus my other home coordinate squared is less than or equal to 25, right? Or I could say something like, you know, in this example with my height and my weight, right? Um, so there's something called the body mass index, which is basically a ratio between uh, your weight and the square of your height. So I could say something like, um, you know, in my height weight example, uh, the body mass index is the uh, weight over the height squared. So if you go to the doctor, they may measure this. Question? That's uh, where you could uh, uh, additional, you mean this thing? Yeah. Yep. Goes yes, this, this goes with this, right? Yeah. Okay. And this is a new, a new example, right? So you go to the doctor and they measure your height and their weight and they measure your body mass index. And then I could ask something like, you know, what is the probability that my 
uh, body mass index is in some good range, whatever that range is, okay? And that would look like, presumably, since this is kind of a weird uh, function of weight and height, it looks like some sort of a, uh, you know, a couple of parabola-type curves, and that region may be enclosed in some sort of a weird region of the plane, right? And so, kind of a, a preview is that, you know, to compute these kinds of probabilities, which we're not going to do today, you're going to have to do integrations of, you know, 2D, not just 1D. So you are really enjoying the 1D integrations, but you're really going to love the 2D integrations, where basically you kind of say, okay, I've got to integrate this event area over the PDF location. That's kind of what we're going to do next week, okay? But that's the basic idea is just like, what do events look like? They look like chunks of the plane. And certainly there's no reason why I couldn't have events that are disconnected pieces, right? I'd say, you know, it's probably of this area or that area, so I could have some sort of weird, you know, types of events. Okay. So let me be a little bit more um, explicit about the uh, coin flip case, okay? So uh, let's think about the, the ways that those coin flips can happen, right? So uh, the coin flip example. with, let's just say, you know, n equals five um, flips, okay? And then let's think about what is this event. So suppose the event is um, less than three heads and uh, the first head is on or after flip number two. Right? So that describes something involves X and something involves Y, right? And so if I think about it, let me just kind of make a little grid of this is the number of flips or the number of heads, and this is the uh, position of the first head. And so I have kind of like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 over here, and I have 0, 1, two, three, four, five over here. And so we can think about like where are the places where I could actually have any non-zero probability at all, right? So if I have zero heads, then uh, I said that my other, so if this is my x, this is my y. If x equals zero, then I tell you that y equals zero. If x equals one, I have basically the possibility of the head has to be on the first flip, right? So if there's only one uh, coin flip, then basically that's where uh, this can be. If I have two heads, then either it's on, uh, oh wait, no, I take this back. So if I, only ha if I have one head, but I have five flips, that head could have occurred anywhere here, my mistake. Sorry about that. Uh, if I have two heads, then the head could occur on the first try, it could occur on the second try, or the third try, or the fourth try. Since I have two heads, it can't occur on the, the first head can't occur on the fifth try because, you know, at best that could be the second head that I got, right? So I have to have the first head at least by flip four. And then kind of I can fill in the rest of this thing, kind of looks like a triangle. If I have five heads, then clearly I had to get the first head on the first flip. There's only one way that can happen, right? So basically these dots are the places where I could have kind of non-zero probability. And then an event is a region of the space, right? So I was saying, okay, I have less than three heads, so that's kind of like my line in X, and the first head occurs on or after flip two. So that would have to be something that looks like a rectangle like this would be the event that corresponds to this picture, right? And so this would be the corresponding event. And so a lot of times to make life easier, we're interested in these kinds of events that look like boxes, basically. So let me stop and ask questions or comments about what I've said so far. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the position of the first head. So this is like the position of the first head, right?
Other questions? Okay, so um, I'm gonna get to how we actually compute this probability in just a second, but um, generally kind of what you see in this kind of picture is um, that we're often interested in these kinds of box type events. Or what are sometimes called product form events. Which are basically boxes. Let's not be too fancy, right? So for example, I give you X and Y, and I wanna know what's the probability that you're inside this rectangular axis oriented box. Or I could kind of generalize the idea of a box to say, okay, I could have a box that is basically infinitely large in one direction. So I could have kind of like a, a bar like this. That would be an okay product form event. Or I could have something that kind of says, okay, I wanna know the probability that I'm below or to the left of this point. So you could kind of have like an open box like this, right? So kind of it's infinitely big on either side. And so these things are all modeled, they're all related to basically an event in X uh, intersected with an event in Y, right? So I can kind of think about this event over here as, you know, this stripe intersected with this stripe gives me this picture over here, right? And those are generally easier kinds of probabilities to compute. So something like this should remind you a little bit of a CDF, right? Because a CDF is basically what we defined in one dimension as the probability that my random variable is less than some value. And this kind of looks like the equivalent idea when I've got a point in two dimensional space. It's like saying, well, I've got to be less than a certain value in X and less than a certain value in Y, right? So I kind of get this whole thing that's kind of open on the left hand side and on the bottom, right? So that's exactly what this is, right? So um, uh, in particular, the, you know, third picture that I have over there defines what we call the CDF for a joint random variable. That is, I have a capital F, capital X, capital Y, little x, little y, right? So, big F, big X and Y. This subscript kind of tells me which two random variables am I looking at, and then these two things are little numbers. And I could use A and B or S and T or something like that, um, and this is defined as uh, the probability that um, my big X is less than or equal to this value, and my big Y is less than or equal to that value. Okay, this is, you know, basically the generalization of the, the 1D CDF. And just like before, you know, I have some rules about this CDF, right? So, um, kind of similar to what we did before. If I talk about the CDF evaluated, you know, way out at, you know, if I push this point all the way off to the edge of the world, I have to have, you know, that's a certain thing, right? So all my probability is contained if I push that dot off way up into the world of the upper right-hand corner, right? And, oh, question, yeah. Like if I push it. Well, so suppose, so, so suppose that I pushed it all the way to the lower, to, to one side, right? Negative infinity in one direction, right? I think that's kind of what you're asking, right? So if I, well, if I have basically negative infinity uh, anything, right? Even though the other side is positive? Even though, even though the other side is positive, because basically I can't have X being 
less than negative infinity, right? So even though this one could be anywhere out here, you know, basically I have to have some value of x, right? That has to happen. So again, if, if I think about like intersecting, you know, the probability that x is less than minus infinity with the probability that y is less than whatever, you know, even if this is one and this is zero, I still get zero, right? Um, in a similar way, you know, if I push the other direction to minus infinity, I'd also get zero, right? That's a good question. I mean, it's kind of important to think about the intuition, right? So there has to be some measurable probability inside, under my umbrella, right? Other questions? So you'll notice, so, so this is, okay. So this gives rise to the concept of, you know, we, we first talked about the CDF and then we defined the PDF, right? So, um, it is true that the derivative of the CDF in 2D is the PDF, but before I get there, I just kind of want to talk about discrete random variables because I think that, again, defining things in the coin flipping world is a little bit more intuitive than going right to the continuous world, right? So we're going to get there next week. Right now, let's go back to the idea of what would be the PMF corresponding to this coin flipping example, right? So we already kind of drew, you know, each of these dots here, you can imagine it's kind of like a delta function that's coming out of the page, right? These are the possible places where I could have some probability mass. So um, similarly, for 2D joint uh, discrete, I guess what I meant is joint discrete random variables, I could have basically a joint PMF, a joint probability mass function, which is, again, we use little p in that case, which is the probability that I exactly get this value x and this value y. Right, so this is little p big X and Y, and then little X and Y. Exactly the same as how we did it for the single random variable case, right? So what would the PMF look like for um, this coin flipping example? So let me draw it again here. Actually, let me draw it on a different page. So um, just to give myself like a nice bunch of room. So for the coin flip example, Uh, again, if I have X and Y, this X was the number of heads, and the Y was the position of the first head. So what would the joint distribution of this look like, right? Well, it's not hard to convince yourself that, so again, kind of before I draw it, kind of what, what we have in, you know, in the joint case is that every kind of dot I'm drawing over here is really like a delta function that's pushing out, right? Because eventually we want to be able to integrate against this thing, and if I just have, you know, you could also think of it kind of like a 2D bar graph, right? So we kind of think about, you know, here are the, values of probability at different points in the, in the plane, right? So what will we have here? Well, um, the probability of having zero heads, those are easy, right? So having zero heads is like failing, uh, you know, five times in a row, so two to the fifth is 32. So this dot at zero, zero, has probability one over 32, right? And to be easier, I'm just gonna multiply, you know, I'm gonna have, this picture just times 132 to make my life a little bit nicer, right? So this has one over 132 probability. In the same way, over here, you know, the probability of getting five heads is also one over 32. Um, and this dot is also constrained, right? This has probability 
1 over 32. I guess I am already messing up my system. 1. Um, what happens over here? Well, here I have two uh, possibilities, right? But one of them is much more likely than the other one, right? So, uh, you know, any given head tail pattern has probability 1 over 32. How many of those have exactly four out of five heads? Well, there's going to be five of those, right? And only one of those five possibilities has tail in the first position. The rest of them have head in the first position, right? So the probability of this guy is 1 over 32. The probability of this guy is 4 over 32. Okay? And I'm going to fill in the rest of the table here. I'm not going to, like, derive the whole thing. So this is 6. So actually, I kind of have this binomial looking thing here as it turns out. So hopefully with a little bit of reasoning, you can convince yourself why this is true, right? So if I say, okay, you know, the probability of getting one head, there are five possibilities for where that one head could be. Each of them is equally likely, so I get, you know, that 530 seconds probability is distributed uniformly over the possible values of y, right? But if I have a small, if I have a large number of heads, then definitely it's more likely that I get the first head earlier, right? So questions about this? So this would be what we call the joint PMF, right? And since I don't intend to make you draw like crazy two-dimensional delta functions, it's okay on this next homework if you just draw your PMF with kind of a picture like this, right? If I ask you for a joint PMF, you can just kind of give me probabilities at different points in the plane with the understanding that these are really delta functions sticking up out of your paper, right? Okay. So now with the concept of the joint PMF, I can then talk about what does the joint CDF look like. Oh, question first. All of them? <laughs> How did, okay, so let's refresh. So, for example, you know, uh, first we start off by saying there are, you know, five coin flips, right? Every one of these coin flip patterns has probability 1 over 32, right? Because there's two choices for five slots, so that's 2 to the fifth. So, then I ask myself, okay, well, um, for example, how about zero heads, right? That has to be T, 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 right? The probability of that is 1 over 32. Same way over here, five heads, this probability, this is like H, 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 right? This one over here, if I have four heads and I get the first head on flip one, is, well, actually, there are a bunch of ways that could happen, right? I could have H, uh, H, 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 T. So it's basically the question of moving around where that possible tail could be, right? So there are four ways that could happen and there's one way that this could happen, right? And that adds up to the five possible ways that I could get the, the four heads, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Question. Yes? Pascal's triangle? No, it just happened to, to turn out this way in this case, right? Uh, yes, so, uh, no, it just happened to be coincidence this is the way it worked, right? Are my eyes like freaking out or is this like auto-focusing on and off a little bit? Maybe my eyes are just freaking out. I'm getting old, you know. All right. So, uh, so we have the joint PMF. So what would be the joint CDF, right? So the joint CDF, right, is the probability that I am less than a certain value of X and a certain value of Y, right? So. What would I do there? And actually, this is a good, a good case for a, a different color pen. So suppose that I want to evaluate, and, and this is something that can be defined anywhere, right? So uh, basically, this can be evaluated man, I can't spell today. Can be evaluated for any value of x and y not just 
integer values. So drawing this is a little bit trickier, right? The way it's going to end up looking is, again, I'm going to mark off my possible values here. So I know a couple things, right? So I know that if I put my question mark over here, clearly I'm going to get zero, right? So I'm going to get zero probability over here. I'm going to get zero probability over here. I'm going to get zero probability over here. Basically, anything out of bounds is going to be zero. So my, you know, I'm going to get zero, big zeros, zero, big fat zero. OK. Now what if I ask about, um, you know, some point over here, right? So let's suppose I ask about like this point. Well, I'm kind of thinking about, okay, what is below and to the left? Uh, let's see if I can do some sort of like really innovative educational technique here. This is why you pay all the money to come to RPI. So everything that's kind of below and to the left of this dot, there's one 30 second probability here. And no matter kind of how I move my paper around, until I bump over this dot over here, everything in this grid square is going to be 1 over 32, right? So kind of I can think about there's kind of like a block of, of pixels where this is going to be 1 over 32. And in this case, if I kind of move my, you know, dot, you know, move my paper up here, you know, I'm not really accumulating any different probability. Actually, all the way up this way is going to be, I'm just going to block this off to make this a little bit easier to see. Right, so everything here is going to be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Now, what happens if I bump over and I ask about, okay, what about this probability over here, right? What is that CDF going to look like? That's everything below and to the left of this dot. Here I can see I've accumulated two units of probability. And that two is going to be true no matter kind of where I move around until I bump over some other dot that has something. So there's going to be kind of like, you know, here's going to be one. Actually, this is also going to be one. So I should really fill in the bottom row is also going to look like a whole bunch of ones. If I look at this, suddenly I have 2 over 32. So again, this is all 1 over 32 times this whole matrix. As I move up, you know, into this grid square, I accumulate another unit. So I'm going to get 3, 4, 5. By the time I get out here, I've got, oh, I didn't make my paper big enough. I'm going to get 6 units of probability. And I keep on doing that, right? So here I've got, as it turns out, 6 units accumulated. Here I've got 4 plus 3 is 7 plus another 3 is 10. Here I add another 3, which is 13. Here I add another 2, which is 15. Here I add another 1, which is 16. Over here, I got 6 plus 4 plus 2 is 12. Here I got the 12 I had plus another 7 is 19 plus another 4 is 23, plus a number, another 2 is 25, plus a number, another one of these is 26, right? And here I got, what, 14, 16, 16 plus 8 is 24, plus 4 is 28, plus 2 is 30, plus 1 is 31, and finally over here I have uh, mind fart. Someone help me. 5 plus 5 is 10, plus this is 17, okay. Plus 8 is 25, 29, 31, 32, right? And everything out beyond this point is 32, okay? So really what the CDF looks like is, again, horrible artist rendition, but basically, if I was thinking about this as a true uh, picture, what it would look like would be a, 
Uh, oh, this is really going to just suck when I draw this picture. So, you know, I've kind of got like a little stair step here and a little stair step here and so on, right? So it's really kind of like a little blocky structure, right? Just like, <laughs> this is like an awful picture, I apologize. So just like in, in 1D, the CDF kind of looked like a stair step that grew from zero to one. In 2D, this looks kind of like a two-dimensional stair step that is climbing from zero to one, right? I've got to reach one in the upper right-hand corner, and I'm going to be zero in the lower left-hand corner, and the more I move to the right or up, I can only be accumulating probability, right? So you can see that these numbers are continuing to not get less as I go to the right or as I go up. So it's kind of a pain to draw. I'll only ask you to do it once on this next homework. But um, yes, but basically that's the concept is that you know, every time I kind of bump over one of these lines, I accrue some more probability. And the sanity check is that you know, I get up to the top and I have added up all my probability. So I have 32 over 32 is equal to one. All right, anyone have anything to say about that? It's good stuff. So once I've got the joint PMF and the joint CDF, I can do all the kinds of things that I did uh, in previous you know, assignments, right? So if I go back to my event and I ask, okay, um, what's the probability that, so now we can use uh, either the PMF or the CDF to compute the probabilities of joint events. Right, so earlier I said there was an event like what's the probability that x is less than three and y is greater than or equal to two. So the easiest thing, right, is to look at my uh, joint PMF, right, which we computed earlier, and say, all right, what is that set of dots, right? X is less than three, Y is greater than or equal to two, is basically this set of seven dots, and when I add them up, I get uh, six plus four is 10 over 32, right? So this is the same as saying uh, sum up for all the outcomes in the event, the PMF values that I have, right? This is just basically add up the dots. Or I could talk about the CDF, right? And I could say, okay, uh, if I wanted to, or I could use the CDF, which would be like saying, okay, the probability of X less than three and Y less than or equal to two is equal to, um, well, let's think about it in terms of uh, what would, so it's gonna be like one minus the probability that, um, Mm, how do I do this? First, let me write something down and see if this makes sense. So it's like saying I want to have uh, suddenly I'm self-doubting like why I wrote this this way. My notes say this. Let's see why this is true. So in words, this is like saying the probability that x is less than or equal to two and y is less than or equal to five minus the probability that x is less than or equal to two and y is less than or equal to one. And that makes sense, right? This is like basically saying that um, x is equal to, uh, you know, I guess x can be zero, one, or two, 
and y is equal to uh, 2, 3, 4, or 5. Uh, oh, this is because I said the wrong event. Right? I want this to be. Now this makes more sense. This is what I was trying to say. This is, what, this is the event that we had before, right? The event corresponding to this. And the same event I have over here. OK. Now I know why I was so confused. So what I could do is I could say, OK, I can use my CDF to compute that if I wanted to. So if I look back at my CDF, I could say, OK, the CDF of 2, comma 5. So that's like saying, you know, I have, to, I have to kind of think about, like, what is the, you know, uh, when do I accrue the probability as I bump over the line, right? So in this case, you know, 2 comma 5 is, like, out here, and that kind of puts me in this cell. And 2 comma 1 is over here, and that kind of puts me in this cell. And I get the same 10 over 32 that I got before. It's kind of like saying, you know, what's the probability of all this stuff minus the probability of all this stuff to give me the same kind of rectangle that I see over here. So clearly, it's a little more tedious to do with the CDF than it would be to do with the PDF, or I'm sorry, to do with the PMF. The PMF makes life easier because I can just like literally, you know, count up dots. Here, it's kind of like I'm looking at cumulative chunks of probability and subtracting pieces, right? Let me draw this in a better way, because I know that this is like a little bit confusing the way I did this here. I don't like the way I did this. Let me say this in a slightly different way before you guys ask any questions. So in general, to compute the probability of kind of like a product type event, product form event, right? If I want to know the probability of what's going on in this box, right? What I could do is look at the corners of this box and say, well, this is equal to this probability, this whole thing here, minus, so I'm going to kind of draw in the corners as ghost circles here, minus this probability, So that's like this guy here, minus this guy here, which is uh, like this. And here, I kind of noticed that I subtracted out one part of this too much, right? So if I draw it like this, I have to add back in this area because I subtracted it out once here and once here. So it's kind of like thinking about drawing the box as the sum of a bunch of things that I can express in the form of a CDF, right? Just in the same way that in one dimension, I was able to say, okay, what's the probability of this interval, right? I could write that like this probability minus this probability, right? And these were both, you know, if this is like A, B, this is like saying the CDF at B minus the CDF at A. In two dimensions, it's the same kind of idea, except we have four things we have to subtract instead of just two. Okay. So a different way of saying this in uh, 2D, in joint events, what we have is that the uh, probability of, you know, if I call this like A comma B, C comma D, then this is going to be uh, C comma B. This is going to be A comma D. Right, so the probability of this box, let's call this A, 
is going to be equal to the CDF at C comma D minus the CDF at A comma D minus the CDF at C comma B plus the CDF over here. And really, you know, even though this seems really convoluted, you know, we're going to do this next lecture where we do this with the PDF, right? So the natural thing to do is say, well, if I want to know what is the probability of this box, I should just integrate over that box the PDF, right? That would be what we're going to do next time, right? And since I know that the CDF is basically like the antiderivative, the integral of the PDF, this is mathematically the same thing that you would get by doing that integral, right? So we're, we're not really doing anything different than what we already knew how to do. Okay. So the reason that this exam so the reason I was kind of getting tangled up in this example is we kind of have to think about, you know, just in the same way that when I first introduced CDFs, right, um, you know, let's just say that for uh, discrete random variable CDFs, we should, you know, keep track of when probability is uh, accrued, right? So again, going back to the one-dimensional CDF, right, originally, if I have this as my PMF, the CDF, when I very first drew it, basically looks like, you know, I have zero up to a certain point, and then as soon as I jump up to here, I accrued this one unit, right? So I kind of drew the CDF like this. I mean, this is not exactly the CDF for this, but basically the idea was that this dot, this closed dot, tells me where the probability actually happens. And then I kind of had my slang method of drawing CDFs, which was just like straight out stair steps, and we kind of forgot about like exactly what was happening on that stair step. So what's happening in 2D is even more complicated to think about, right? Because in 2D, it's like saying, okay, when I'm on the line, how do I know which side of the line I should interpret my CDF on? Same kind of thing. So, as, so basically, you know, everything on this side of the line is actually going to this box, and everything above this line is going to this box. So basically, that's how the box boundaries work, is that you refer to the guy who is above you or to the right of you, right? That's why when I drew this dot here, I knew that it was actually referring to the 16 and not one of these other boxes, right? So I confused myself briefly, but then I fixed myself, right? So that's kind of like what's happening. Luckily, in most cases, you know, when we, when we talk about continuous straight random variables, there's not going to be any ambiguity about these delta functions. We're going to just move right into the world of smooth, sweet functions. And actually, I believe that the problem that I'm asking you to look at on the homework is a continuous PDF, or I'm sorry, a continuous CDF. So the first problem on the homework is along this line. I'm going to ask you, okay, what's the probability of your being inside this box? But the CDF I'm going to give you is a nice, smooth function. So all you have to do is plug the numbers in, right? There is no worrying about delta functions and what side of the box am I on. Don't worry about that stuff, right? Um, I will ask you to draw a CDF similar to this in the second problem of the homework, but you don't necessarily have to use it for anything. So I'm, I'm going a little bit more tediously into things in this lecture that I'm going to actually ask you to do on the homeworks and on the exam. Okay, so I feel like I talked to myself for about 15 minutes there. So questions or comments about all the stuff that just came out of my mouth. All right. So, one new concept, right? And this is actually the whole, con the, the, the whole point of this lecture is building to this new idea, which is a simple idea. So, so far, nothing is new, right? PDF, CDF, yeah, we heard all that stuff before, right? So, a new concept for joint random variables, an important New concept for joint random variables is what's called the marginal PDFs.
okay? So the idea here is that suppose I give you a joint distribution of random variables, right? Suppose I've got a table of x, y dots in the plane that are like heights and weights, right? So sometimes I don't care about the other random variables, and I just want to throw one of those random variables away and, and just concentrate on one of the other random variables, right? So let's say, okay, I've got this height-weight table. I don't care about height. Just tell me about weight, right? So that's called taking the marginal, I guess because height feels marginalized and bad, right? So uh, the marginal uh, PMF, for example, is defined as just saying, okay, I want to know what is the probability of getting a given value in X. I don't care about Y, right? This is like saying the probability that X is the value I care about and Y is anything. Which is the same thing as like saying, okay, you know, I'm going to fix X and then I'm going to sum over all the possible values of y, right? So I'm saying I'm fixing x and I'm letting y vary over all the possible values that it could take on, right? And the same way, uh, the marginal in y is like saying I don't care about what happens in x. I just want to know what the probability of getting this value is. And this is like the sum in the other direction. It's like saying sum up over all the possible values of x and keep that yj fixed. So it's basically just like saying I just want to know about one random variable and kind of forget about all the other stuff, right? So let's look, for example, at the coin flipping again, right? So here was the now much marked up picture of the coin PMF, right? So I could say, okay, suppose that I just gave you out of the blue, here's this PMF, okay? Then you might be interested in, okay, I only really care about the number of heads, right? So can you just tell me what the, you know, probability of getting zero through five heads is without all this other stuff about why? So what the marginal is saying is basically just like adding up down the columns or across the rows to get just the PMF of that random variable. So these aren't really new. These are just like what happens if I ignore the joint relationship. So for example, uh, in the coin example, you know, if we're given this joint PMF, uh, you know, we get the marginals. by summing along the rows and columns, right? So what would I get if I looked at the marginal in X, right? So in X, if I saying, okay, regardless of the value of Y, what is the probability of getting a certain value of X? So here I have 1 over 32 is just this guy. Here, I would have 5 over 32, which is the sum of this 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Then for this guy, I have 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 is 10 over 32. And then I have 6 plus 3 plus 1 is another 10 over 32. Then I have 5 and 1. Right? So this is the marginal just on X. And I already told you, right, we already knew that, you know, this is just by itself the, number, the probability of getting a certain number of heads. We already knew that this was a binomial random variable, right? And in fact, this is this, the usual kind of like symmetric bell curve, right? We already knew that that was going to be binomial. And what we get if we summed along the rows, right? So in Y, Again, my possibilities are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So if I sum along the zero row, I get 
1 over 32. If I sum along the one row, I get a lot of stuff. I get 10 plus this is 16, right? If I sum along this row, I get uh, 8. And then I get 4. Then I get 2. And then I get 1, right? So actually, this marginal in Y looks, you know, basically geometric. Which again, we also kind of knew that if I just were to ask you about the pattern of, you know, when do I get the first head, in general, that's a geometric random variable. Right? This looks exactly like geometric, but it doesn't have the long tail that the normal geometric has. All that long tail has been kind of sucked into this zero thing. So this is what makes it a little bit different than a normal geometric random variable, but normally, you know, it's pretty close, right? So that's the kind of key concept that I really want you to take away from today is this notion that if I give you a joint distribution, that if I add down one direction, I get a marginal just for that x-axis, and if I add in the other direction, I get just a marginal on the y-axis. And you can see where this is going next week is that when you've got a continuous PDF, I integrate instead of adding, right? So we're going to do a whole bunch of, like, integrals to get down one axis or down the other axis, right? But for the moment, all we're doing is just kind of, like, adding stuff up, right? And in the same way, we could talk about kind of, like, the marginal CDF, if I wanted to, right? So, um, so first, before I do that, let me just ask, because this is a really, if you remember nothing else from today, this is what I want you to remember. So questions about how do I obtain marginal PMFs? This is something that is really refreshing after all this other crappy tables. stuff. it's just like taking the rows and columns of a table and adding them up, right? You guys can do that. Um, so again, there is also a concept of a uh, marginal CDF, the cumulative version, which is kind of like saying, you know, what I should be able to get if I look at just X alone is the same thing that I should get if I take the joint CDF and ask about this value of X and infinite, right? This is like saying the probability that X is less than or equal to little x and Y is less than infinity, right? Which it has to be, right? So this part has to happen. And so this is kind of like the, uh, you know, if I look at my joint CDF, right? Let me pull that out. So that's like saying, okay, you know, the probability that X is less than some value and Y is less than anything, right? So in some sense, I should be able to read off the joint CDF just by looking at the top row of this table, right? So this is kind of like saying the top, you know, row of the table should give me what I want. And if I look at that, I can say, okay, that matches my intuition, right? So here, as I bump over zero, I get one thirty second, then I add five and I get six, then I add 10 and I get 16, I add another 10, I get 26, I add five and I add one, right? So the top row of this table is kind of like the marginal cumulative distribution function. And the same way, the right-hand row will give me what I get if I add up these arrows, right? So first I get one, then I add 16, I get 17, then I add eight, I get 25, and so on. So I can just kind of read off the marginal CDFs if I have access to the whole table, right? In a similar way, this is like what I'm saying is that the marginal CDF in Y is like saying, you know, X can be anything, and I want Y to be less than little y. This is kind of like the right row of the table. Oops, sorry, right column. So I could get at the joint CDF, I, I'm sorry, I could get the marginal CDFs in a couple different ways, right? But, and this is the big but, is that, you know, just knowing the marginals isn't enough to get me back to the joint, right? So clearly, if I, if I give you access to the joint random variable, you know everything about how those two things can possibly vary and what possible pairs of values can be taken on, right? 
And if I want to know, okay, what's x alone, y alone, I can compute that. But once I projected down or to the right, I have lost the possible correlations between the random variables. Right? I can't, can't go back again. So uh, that's kind of an important idea is that uh, just knowing the marginal PDFs isn't enough to uh, figure out or to recreate the joint PDF or I guess I'm using PDF here. We really only talked about PMFs today, but I think you guys know what I, whoops, I think you guys know what I mean, right? That, for example, let's suppose that I have this PMF where each of these values is one quarter and this PMF where this has value three eighths, this has value three eighths, and these guys have value one eighth, right? So to compute the marginals, I would add up this way and add up that way. So my marginal in this direction is one half, one half. My marginal in this direction is also one half, one half. And if I do the same addition over here, I get the same result, right? I get one half, one half, and I get one half, one half. So the marginal PDFs for these two situations are the same, but clearly the random variables at a joint level are different, right? So we can have the same marginal PDFs arising from different uh, joint random variables. Right, so for example, what would these kind of correspond to? So maybe these are the values of a coin flip, like, you know, I can imagine that these things correspond to tail, tail, uh, like, so one of these is the value on the first throw and the other one is the value on the second throw. So if I think about this kind of like flipping a coin, the first case is like saying, I've got a totally fair coin, right? So the probability of each of those four possibilities is equal at one quarter, right? The second case is something that would be kind of like, if such a thing were to exist, kind of like a uh, biased coin that was encouraged to somehow come up either two heads or two tails, right? Because I can see that two heads or two tails are much more likely than one head or one tail. So if you had some sort of like smart coin that was able to, you know, kind of duplicate the last toss that it had, then that would be like a loaded coin, right? So by marginalizing out, we lose the coupling between the adjacent throws, right? And so this is kind of really important is that, um, you know, next time and next week, we're gonna kind of talk about um, things like uh, independence and correlation and things like that that kind of expose how two random variables are likely to be related, right? And so, uh, and that's really important from a real world analysis point of view because lots of times you're trying to understand you know, how two quantities of interest are related. Maybe one is something that you can observe and one is something that you want to predict, right? And so it's really important to know, you know, if things are really well correlated, then I have a good chance of predicting Y from X. If things are poorly correlated, then knowing X doesn't tell me anything about knowing Y, right? So in terms of a useful real world situation, this is kind of nice, right? Because if I tell you one random variable, I know something about what's going to happen on the other. This is like kind of like the totally un correlated independent case where knowing one thing doesn't tell you anything about the other thing. So, you know, that's kind of why we care about multiple random variables is that in lots of real-world situations, we're trying to do these kinds of problems of prediction, which kind of come down to how these things are related. Okay. So questions about this example with the marginals. Okay. Then that's all I have to say. Other than